Hello, good evening, if you're watching this live, or good morning, good afternoon, wherever you're getting Cross's Corner from. I'm Archie Cross, and with me is the amazing, the one and only, the superb Freddie Davison. Hi, Crossy. Nice to be here. Thanks for having me on. <laughs> yeah, well, I've really been looking forward to, to, to getting you on cause to, to talk about things, because um, I, I think you're a remarkable oarsman, and I think anyone that watches you row will, will know that, and... Uh, Kind of want to know a bit of your secret, if you can, you know, fill us in on that. Not now, but uh, we'll get to that in, in, in the course of our chat. Yeah, um, yeah no, of course. I mean, uh, it's nice to be complimented about your own. Yeah. But, um, yeah. <laughs> so listen, Freddie, how's your day been today? Uh, yeah, it's, it's been fairly chilled out, I guess. Um so I'm I'm I live in Henley, so I can see the regatta kind of going on around me, and it's uh, been really busy here. Uh, but I've been uh, training down at Wallingford uh, in the morning and then just had quite a chilled afternoon. So, yeah, just uh, training quite hard towards uh, our race at the end of the week in the stewards. So most people will um, think, well, you, you train around Cavisham. So how come you're on the Wallingford stretch? Um, so we've been doing a few kind of blocks of training down on the river. Um, I think the kind of main thinking and the main benefit from that is we just can do quite long mileage step uh long mileage sessions without stopping without spinning around so Caversham's 2k lake which means if you're doing 20k or something you're doing uh was it 10 spins i guess uh to get the full 20k in um but down in wallingford we can kind of go 10k in one direction and spin around do t uh, 10k the other direction so it, it just makes the training a little bit more continuous and uh it is really good for like bedding in technical changes uh, yeah. as well as physiology yeah oh uh that's really interesting. Um, Cam Kilty, who's uh, a gr great follower of, of Cross's Corner, I think from the States, um, has has shoved in this question. And I think I, I kind of thought we'd get to it later, but he's bunged it up there early, um, which is a nice compliment to you. Um, yeah, very nice compliment. Thank you very and, much. Um, yeah, so uh, I, I, I think to kind of start off, we can kind of un, unwrap it, but maybe you can give us a few little pointers to Cam's question. Um, yeah, I mean, I, I think I've, I've been very lucky through my rowing career so far to have lots of um, very technically minded coaches. Um, I had Bobby Thatcher at St Paul's um, with Donald Leggett, um, and then I had Donald again at Cambridge with Steve Trapmore and then Rob Baker um, and Rich Chambers. Uh, and then... Um, I spent a year at Brooks as well before going in, into the GB team um, with uh, Henry Bellish Webb and, and Rich Spratley. Um, so I've had quite a kind of uh, eclectic mix of coaches, but all with, I guess, a, a, quite a common theme. Um, and that's just kind of a f like making the most effective leg driven drive possible. Um, and so um, I guess the way. I've ended up rowing has been a kind of emerging of all of, all of that. But um, uh, I'd say the, the kind of formative years at St. Paul's and then Cambridge have probably driven most of uh, the way I row, um, which is just trying to be as efficient as possible, loose as possible, and um, just trying to kind of waste as least energy as possible. Um, and I, I mean, my kind of uh, take on that is that um, if you can kind of keep the upper body as loose as you can, that's kind of, um, allowing you to use the big muscles and the big levers to propel the boat forwards without wasting any energy getting tense. Um, so that's the kind of, I guess, my um, yeah. very basically the, the, the way I think about it. Um, it's just kind of trying to be as loose as possible and let the big muscles work and hang off the handle. Um, yeah, I hope that's a kind of reasonable summing up. So I, I think there, there's interesting things in that. I mean, uh, I, I remember looking across at you. We were waiting for the flight to come back from Bled, I think it was. Mm. And I was saying to Camilla Hadlin, who was um, sort of one of the commentators out there, um, he's not the biggest rower in the world. I mean, how, how many kilos are you? you? I mean, you're not short at, at all. But, no, um, I'm, I'm, I'm kind of 6'2", six, 6'3", six, on a good day. Um, I'm kind of... Well, I vary a bit, but I hover at probably around 85 kilos. Um, probably raced last year a bit lighter, maybe 83, 84. Um, but I'm normally around that 85 kilo mark, sometimes a bit more, sometimes a bit less. Yeah. So um, 
I I think um, so. I'm going back to a previous time. I know you weren't in Jurgen Grobler's squad, mm. but um, you are not the obvious profile of a rower to be in Jurgen Grobler's squad. Um, I know he had Tim Foster. I, you, you're kind of a bit like a Tim Foster or a Tom James. Yeah, I mean, I think like if you look through some like quite a lot of successful boats in the past, not all of them are massive hunks of, of, of meat who are just ch- like churning down power. Like there's, um, I mean, I, I'd probably an extreme example because I'm physically smaller-ish um, and probably in terms of like ergo performance, um, quite far off a lot of the guys. Um, but I think in, in quite a lot of crews, you see there's um, guys who you can kind of think of as a facilitator, I guess, um, you know, some people might call them like a rhythm guys or whatever. Um, but I think you can be quite effective at low weight um, just by the way that you row, how you apply the power. And, you know, you can still get quite a lot of power out from um, from a, a slightly smaller frame. Obviously, I'm not like a, I'm not a tiny guy, but um, compared to some of the uh, bigger guys, I'm, uh, I'm a bit smaller. But, you know, you look through boats and you can see guys like Tim Foster, Tom James, um, I was listening to Alex Gregory a while ago talking about his career and how uh, yeah. he kind of came from being physically a lot weaker than a lot of the guys he was rowing with. And maybe towards the end of the career, he was he was a bit stronger um, and kind of similar with Drew Ginn. Like when he mm. kind of started off as a, a younger guy in the Aussie four, he was probably physically a bit weaker than the other guys, but um, obviously incredibly effective. Um, so, yeah, I'm just trying to, you know... Uh, do my best to, to kind of move towards what those guys, those, those guys could do in the boat. Well, it, I, I think it's interesting because um, uh, we we had on um, Antonio Colomonici uh, two or three weeks ago, and he's the chief Romanian coach, and he took that Romanian four uh, to a silver medal in Tokyo. And I know you've you you've kind of come up against that four. I think it's, it, it's one different, but he was basically talking about rowers now are far more live that they're not really big he was talking about this four and i think you might erase some of that four as a junior i think they might have beaten you as a junior one year yeah Um, i think i think quite a lot of them were in the 20s or maybe two of them were in the 2016 junior four who were yeah they were awesome they were like ridiculously quick yeah but can you can you guess what that tokyo fours 2k average was I, I guess, kind of having seen the guys, I guess around low 50s, low 550s. 609. 609, really? Yeah. Yeah, that is impressive. Yeah. I, I, now, I, I, I know that you are keen. Uh, you, you don't have to tell us your ergo score because I know kind of the, the British squad are quite difficult. But I'm, I'm just mm. like, are you sub six? Yeah, yeah, I'm, I'm sub six. Um, but I mean, even in, in the British squad, I'm, that, that's, uh, yeah. It's towards the towards the weaker end of the of the squad, uh, but yeah, six or nine. That's that's very impressive. Um, clearly, like very effective, um, effective on the water. Yeah, yeah. I I I think their their slowest ergo. I think it was a six sixteen or something. Uh, mm. They they did have one big power guy in there. Uh, I think at a fifty one. But um, yeah, yeah. Obviously, the fours got a lot that it does through movement and, and flow and, you know, um, and dynamic power, which is kind of similar to the way that you row. Um, so um, it's really quite interesting. I think one of the striking images from um, the Varese World Cup, which we just had um, uh, 10 days or so ago, was the image of that Australian four, and your four, because we got it twice in the semi and in the final. And, you know, with Alex Hill at stroke, I mean, they really kind of smack it along. You know, there, there's, I, I know you've raced the Australians quite a lot, uh, not necessarily with Alex Hill in the stroke seat. And the contrast to the way you were rowing, which was, I think, with more fluidity and, and flow and, and seeming looseness, w- w- was quite apparent. Yeah, I think, I mean, there's obviously like lots of different styles of rowing. Um, I think our our style in our in 
the four at the moment has been quite centered around kind of the stuff I was saying earlier, staying loose, staying long, delivering power under the water with the legs in the back. Um, and as I said earlier, that kind of like lends itself to quite a kind of loose upper body. Um, and it also means that our rate is often a little bit lower than other crews, yeah. um, which is not something we're kind of looking to do. But um, I think for us to get kind of the most efficient race pace, it just tends to be a little bit lower than some what some of the other crews are doing. Um, I, I mean, the Australians, I think last Olympiad, uh, were overrating quite a lot of crews, like just like the Romanians were, um, and have continued to do it this Olympiad. And I mean, you can see, like in Varese, uh, I mean, it was it was very nice to win the race. But um, if you look at kind of the race as a whole, there was very little that separated those two crews. So I think like mm. both styles are, you know, they both have their advantages. Um, I think uh, one thing that's kind of I guess a benefit to the way we've been doing things is just that um, we've talked a lot about uh, not just using rate for rate's sake. So when we actually do up the rate, even if it's a pip, we're looking to increase the boat speed. So it's more about increasing boat speed than necessarily just just popping the rate up. Um, and because we rate a little bit lower, that gives us somewhere kind of to go when we when we do use that. Um, I mean. Yeah, the, the race in Varese was a complete lung buster. So um, we were just pleased to come away with the win. But um, yeah, I think the, the way the Aussies are rowing can be can be super effective. Um, and you see, like when they when they get it right, it the, you know last Olympiad especially, like they were kind of taking lengths out of the field um, with, with that style of rowing. Um, so I think it's it's probably a, a slightly more difficult one to get the efficiency of. Yeah. Um, just having that many strokes per minute um i think you know the, the the points in the stroke where the efficiency is kind of most vulnerable is probably the front end and 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 the release the finish um so obviously if you're taking more strokes a minute there's more uh, i guess risk of losing that efficiency um, yeah you know i think i think it can have a payoff because it's a very kind of like tappy rhythm um you know you, you see lots of cyclists talking about uh their rpm like yeah. how many, the cranks for a tape per minute and obviously uh, in cycling, if you watch the Tour de France, they're all go the legs whizzing up and down at like a hundred rotations a minute. So um, there's definitely something to be said for um, increasing the rate of what you're doing because it just means you have to put less force per stroke down. Um, but yeah, I think uh, for us, we're quite happy with the way we're where we're approaching it. But um, I, yeah, I, mean, I fully yeah. appreciate it. there's lots of different ways of skinning a cat. Do you know Daniel Spring, or you've heard of him, Fat Scala? I have heard of him. I've, I've never met him in person. Okay. But, yeah. Well, he's he's listening to us. Hi, Daniel. It's really great that you're here. Um, he's got this uh, point, um, which I guess is what we've been talking about. Yeah. Um, just having a read. Yeah. I mean, I think, as I said, we're not, as a squad, we're not looking to necessarily um, have a lower rate than anyone else as a, as a kind of hallmark of our rowing, I think it's more of a product of the way we're approaching uh, uh, approaching the rowing. And I think really, I don't think the GB rowing style has necessarily changed um, that much in the last few Olympiads. But I think the rest of the world or some other countries have uh, been toying around with the higher rates. I think, mm. you know, if you go back 10 years and look at races, uh, most of the crews are probably going to be rating similar to what the GB squad's doing at the moment. Um, but you know, some other countries have managed to get some really good results out of trying a slightly higher rating style. Um, so yeah, I, I wouldn't say it's necessarily us trying to do anything different. It's more just we're kind of sticking to our guns, if you like, staying with the the, the pattern that that our coaches trust that we've kind of bought into, um, and just kind of um, yeah, letting letting other countries uh, try out different styles. But um, yeah, we're just kind of sticking to what what we've always done if you like just just talk us through what your coach christian felkel brings to the crew yeah i mean i, th I think christian's an amazing coach um he's a really uh good coach to work with in in a kind of crew boat i think um he's quite a personal guy which is nice mm. um and i think just kind of having gone through different levels of the sport the the kind of binding factor of all the really good coaches i've had um, and all of them have been really good coaches is that 
Um, they're quite personable. A lot of them um, have been athletes, which maybe helps. Um, and it's more of a conversation than necessarily them telling you what to do and you as an athlete kind of taking that on board and doing it. There's, there's, a, there's feedback as well. Um, and especially kind of higher up in the sport you go, I think that's more and more important. So um, I think his, his approach to, to running the crew and, and, and coaching the crew is, is just that. It's a conversation rather than uh, necessarily him kind of dictating what he wants us to do. Um, and I think that gets quite a lot of buy-in from us as, as athletes. Um, and then, yeah, as I said earlier, like I think his, his style of rowing that he's coaching uh, is very aligned with what, what we want to do, which is, yeah, just using the big muscles as much as possible very nice and long um, and trying to be as efficient as we can um, on the boat and kind of letting the boat run as much as we can. Yeah. Mm, I, I guess, uh, I mean, looking forward, uh, like the Aussies has only been in the country in Europe for about eight or nine days or something before the Racing World mm. Cup. So I guess they, they must think that they're going to get faster for World Cup 3 in Lucerne and presumably I don't know if they're staying over do you know if they're staying here for the World Championships in I, I have no idea I, I, I don't yeah. know either but you know say if they do, do stay I mean that contest is going to be one of the highlights I, I think of Lucerne World Cup 3 and the World Championships yeah I mean yeah the Aussies are obviously going to be uh, pretty fast <laughs> uh full boat of olympic champions if it stays that way um and yeah i think like they're kind of i guess newly reformed so um i think we'd definitely expect them to be um pushing on speed wise um smoothing out um so yeah for us the challenge is um to not kind of be happy with the early season rip wins um and just to con continue kind of looking for bits of speed where we can um, and you know this block uh, from Varese into Lucerne is going to be really important for that um, so we're racing Henley uh, we've just got one race on the Sunday um, and that should be a, a pretty good opportunity for us on a slightly longer course to just try and put into place some of the stuff we've been working on at the river um, it's got a, obviously longer course probably means the kind of middle K is elongated to 1100 or uh, 1200 mm. meters um so hopefully that should be like a really a good opportunity for us to have kind of take what we've learned from lucerne put it into a performance at henley and then uh, at Verizzi, sorry and then uh, and then take that on to lucerne um but yeah i mean i think our uh, as a crew our mentality uh last year and then this year in, in the kind of slightly newer lineup has always been um just to focus on getting from the start to the 2000 meter line as fast as we can as a unit um, and then afterwards do the thinking. So we're not trying to go out and race anyone. We're just trying to put forward the best piece we can on the day um, and then kind of analyze afterwards. And, you know, if we then turn out, you know, we lose in Lucerne, um, uh, whoever that might be, um, we can then kind of look at our own performance mm. and see what we did wrong rather than, look back and say, oh, well, we reacted to this, we reacted to this, we reacted to this, because that's not useful for us. Um, it's much more useful for us to kind of look at what internally and what we're doing and what we can control. Um, and, it, you know, it probably sounds pretty, you know, mundane and it's a <laughs> tale as old as time, you know, control the controllable. Um, but it's, it has served us quite well so far. Um, and, you know, it, it might might not turn out perfectly the whole season, but um, I think that's what, what, what we're trying to kind of aim towards, I guess, is um, just being internal and trying to make the changes we can. Um, and then we'll kind of see how that stacks up against the rest of the field. Yeah. One of the things um, that Matt Aldridge wrote um, in his sort of notes that the, the commentators look at was that he was absolutely chuffed to be in the four after a really sort of tough selection process. And that yeah. was a selection process that saw two of the, the world champions from your crew in mm. uh, 2022, uh, Will Stewart and Sam Nunn, drop out of contention. In fact, drop out of, you know, one of the, the, the main three men's sweet boats. Can you just talk us through that selection process and maybe how tough it was? Yeah, I mean, I don't know how, how, how in-depth I want to go into other people's personal selection. Yeah, yeah, that's fair, fair shout. In, 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 in general, I think, 
you know, the GB rowing system works based on pairs trials. Um, so we have the final trials and then a selection period after that. Um, and um, I guess kind of the, the performances from the full season, that selection trial, which is a 2K pairs regatta, and then the selection period afterwards um, before Europeans all kind of come together into what the coaches um, select for, for that first race. Um, and I think, I mean, the one thing I would say about the selection this year is that um, kind of across the board, it, it was just savagely tight. I think one thing that's going really well for us as a team, which makes it also quite difficult, is that the standard is um, just very strong from kind of top to bottom of the team. Mm. Um, and I think, you know, you saw that last year when uh, uh, Dave Ambler jumps into the four at Worlds um, and yeah. we still managed to come away. Uh, come away with a win. Um, I think that kind of kind of goes to show that the standard is almost almost level. Um, so you know, I'm counting my lucky stars. I've still got a seat, um, and I get to get to go out and and have the opportunity to race. Um, but yeah, I mean, obviously, a super tough situation for for those two guys. And uh, to be fair, then they took it like absolute champs. They've been like awesome to be around since. Uh, they went out and won the spare pairs race uh, at Europeans and Wheels now jumped in the eight and, you know, um, absolutely sending it in the bow seat and, uh, you know, produced one of the fastest times the GBA has done in a long time. So um, I think, yeah, it, it kind of goes to show the calibre of like the, the standard of the rowing, but also of, of the guys and the team um, that they can kind of respond like that and, uh, and support the team like that as well. Can you give us including yourself, a little insight into the personalities of your four and what they're like racing, what they're like to be around, what they bring yeah. to the boat. Yeah, that's a good question. Okay. Um, yeah, so I think, I guess the, the first thing to say is that me and Dave Ambler, who's the two seat, uh, have been, yeah, you know, best mates since, since school. So we know each other must be coming on for 11 years now wow maybe more maybe 12 years so yeah i've known him a long time we live together we spend too much time together probably <laughs> um but it does mean that you know um in terms of our rowing we're um we're, we're pretty aligned on, on how we row what we're looking for um and it's just easy to kind of have a laugh uh with dave yeah. uh, just because i know him so well um yeah the other two we've known, I mean, I row with Matt Aldridge. Um, I probably uh, row with him first in like 2016 or 17. I was in the under 23s with him in 2018. Uh, and I did a year with him at Brooks as well. So I know Matt pretty well. Uh, and Wilksy was a similar situation. Um, I hadn't raced with him actually until um, Bled. It was the first race we've done, oh, apart from the Grand. So the first yeah. international race I've done with him, uh, but I've known him since 2017. So I guess the first thing to say is it's like it's it's, it's a pretty fun group of personalities just because we know each other pretty well. Um, we it, there was no um, there was no kind of fear of having a returning guy in the boat and kind of young guys coming in um, from from the start last year and this year. It's just been a pretty clean slate of we're all kind of on the same level same uh kind of rowing trajectory uh which has made it really like a really fun project to um to try and like move on together um i guess if i go through the boat um <laughs> i think t to be honest it's quite it's we're all we're all quite um immature outside of rowing um <laughs> it's, Come on. it's um yeah i mean if you if you ask uh paul stannard uh what we're like it's normally us who he has to kind of come over and tell to sharp because we're shouting or doing something stupid. Um, it's, it's, it's like a very fun, fun crew to be a part of. Um, and I think that's like part of the ethos that's come through from Brooks um, is that kind of the ability to kind of enjoy what we're doing as well as work hard. Um, you know, uh, Wilkes, he's come from uh, Liverpool and then Edinburgh um, and then to Brooks and, um, and yeah, so that's just kind of his trajectory through rowing. Um, and we affectionately call him the churner because he's absolutely mental on the watts. Um, he's very strong. 
Um, he's probably the strongest guy uh, in in the boat. Um, and yeah, just his physiology is 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 pretty incredible. Um, but he's also um, like very good steersman, obviously. Um, yeah. It's been great so far this season in the bow seat. Um, and is generally just kind of the the kind of quietest guy when we're actually rowing. He just kind of yeah. takes care of business for us so the rest of us can um yeah, can can be ourselves. Um uh but when he does pipe up it's it's normally with something pretty um pretty good. Like his calls in the boat when he when he does say something uh, um yeah. a normal bang on. Um I'd say um Dave is you know vying for the seat of most immature in the boat um <laughs> he's yeah uh he's he's yeah he's a bit of a joker um but he's also got quite a well he's got a very competitive streak um i think that's why he's worked quite well in the two seats so far is that when he wants to be kind of mid-race he's very demanding mm. um which is really useful because he's making the calls um uh, so i mean it's a position that sam nunn did like awesomely well last year um so i think dave's kind of tried to take that up as well um it, and if that means he has to kind of be quite harsh to the rest of us during the race um you know we've told him you know carte blanche do whatever he wants and say whatever he wants to us if it's going to get us going um and do what, we, what he wants us to do so he's 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 a really good personality in that respect because he's very good at kind of switching on and off mm-hmm. um which can be quite, I mean, quite amusing in itself when you see Dave go from jokey Dave to serious Dave in like a split second. Um, but yeah, no, really good guy to row with. Um, Aldridge, yeah, Aldridge is an enigma. He's, <laughs> I'd, I'd say he's probably one of the most talented guys I've rowed with. Um, he's, yeah, exceptional athlete. Um, and uh, me and him kind of share a love of... Um, getting distracted and looking at birds while we're uh, rowing along. <laughs> Lots of red kites in the sky around Cavisham. Yeah. Um, so usually it's kind of me pointing at a bird and asking what it is. Um, but yeah, uh, yeah, he's uh, probably, of all of us, he's the kind of most uh, wise and old uh, mentally. Um, I'd say he's, if you had to kind of pick a dad of the crew, it would be Aldridge. Ah. But yeah, probably... Yeah, yeah, I got that's how I describe him. Um, but yeah, again, like a really like fun character to be around. Um, he's very rarely serious. Um, and yeah, he's 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 got a kind of alter ego, which is Race Day Aldridge. Um, <laughs> when Race Day Aldridge comes out, like it's um, yeah, it's like a like a different person, he's he's on it. Um, so yeah, it doesn't necessarily necessarily come out um, every week or every month, but um, yeah, when when Race Day Aldridge comes out, he's um, he's a yeah, really really competitive guy. Um, as I said, like as an athlete, very very talented. Um, and of the of the four of us, he's probably kind of the the most in tune with the boat. I'd say um, he's like a very oh. very good guy. Um, he came from stroke side. Did a bit of sculling last year and did really well at the trials and then went on to bow side and won trials with uh, Josh Bogowski. So he's like a, in, especially in a kind of a small boat context, he's like very talented, at um, mm. like very in tune with the boat and very efficient. Um, but has also kind of come through um, the Brooks School of Rowing from, uh, you know, beginning of his degree. Um, so he's very much from that school of thought as well. Um which makes him, yeah, very powerful, but also yeah. like very, very good at kind of being efficient and letting the boat run. Um, and yeah, then there's me. Um, <laughs> I kind of fit in somewhere. Um, I guess similar-ish to Dave. I, I, I'm, I'd say I'm generally fairly relaxed and chilled out, but I definitely do have um, a kind of fiery streak, which comes out occasionally. I think. Um, yeah, like uh, if you speak to anyone I rode with at Cambridge, it's probably more pronounced there. Um, but yeah, um, on kind of race day, I can be quite quite grumpy, quite serious. But um, I, yeah, it's a bit of a kind of two poles, um, which you know um, I think is 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 a is a benefit in a sense because it means um, as a crew we can all kind of 
um, relax and enjoy the training. Mm. But, um, it also means when we actually switch on, we we're quite good at getting down to getting down to business. Um, um, yeah. One of the what uh, we, we're going to talk about some of the influences that you mentioned already in in mm. your own, Fred. But uh, one of them is Oxford Brooks, and I think uh, probably one of the most watched crosses corner was Richard Spratley talking yeah. about Brooks. So um, from your experience there, uh, you know, for, for the year that you were there and, and given your experience of all, what, if you could sum up the Brooks experience or the Brooks philosophy and how come it's so effective? Yeah, I mean, I, I can't, as you said, I was only there for a year, so I can't kind of claim to be uh, Brooks born and bred. Um, I've obviously got a lot of influence from where I was before at Cambridge for four years mm. uh, and at school before that. But um yeah, I had a great year at Brooks. Um, I think the the standout thing for me at Brooks is probably the culture they've got. Um, and I think that kind of goes into the rowing as well. But the culture is very much, um, you turn up there and you're exactly the same as everyone else, regardless of what you've done, uh, which was like, I think exactly what my kind of group of guys needed. Um, so I, I started at Brooks with, uh, quite a lot of guys who graduated um, from other universities and needed a place to go and train. Um, so um, guys like Dave Buick Copley, Tom Digby, um, Lenny Jenkins, um, we all kind of went down to Brooks. Um, and yeah, we turned up on day one and it was kind of clean slate. doesn't matter what you've done before. Um, and you'll notice uh, when you watch Henley, all of the crews from Brooks were exactly the same thing. There's no kind of first date uniform, second date uniform, third date uniform. They all got exactly the same lycras, mm. uh, exactly the same, uh, same boats, same blades. Um, it's just like a kind of um, uniform all the way down from the top boat to the bottom boat. Um, and that kind of goes into the culture as well, I think. Um, there's no real kind of ego at Brooks. And if 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 they if you do have an ego, it's quite quickly kind of stamped out. Um, not in a bad sense, like it, 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 I think it's a good thing. Um, and it means that there's really good competition from the top of the boat club right down to the bottom of the boat club. Um, and everyone's just very accountable. Um, and I think that's probably kind of bled into, into the way they row as well. Uh, I think if you watch any Brooks boat, they from kind of top eight to, down to the, down to the bottom eight, they've got a very clear way of rowing. It's very simple. Um, and it's very uniform. So, you know, my experience at Brooks was you could throw any eight people in the boat, Mm. And it would feel very similar. It would feel very clean, very set up, um, very efficient rowing, um, especially in, in, in the eights. Um, so, yeah, I think that kind of is a is a reasonable summing up. Hopefully, yeah. Uh, well, it's 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 fascinating to for you to have that yeah. experience because, of course, your first experience, I guess, you learned to row at St Paul's. Yeah. Um, with this amazing coach, Bobby Thatcher. Um, so what did you learn about rowing from Bobby? What was it like to be coached by Bobby? Yeah, I think, I mean, obviously being coached by Bobby was a privilege. Um, I think probably, um, you know, one of the greatest coaches in the country, if not the world. Um, and you can see that from from the calibre of the crews he kind of creates year on year. Um, and it's a bit of a weird one because... I probably didn't appreciate it as much as the at, at the time. And it's only ah. kind of looking back, I realised how lucky I was to have him, um, uh, and and all the other coaches I had at St Paul's. Like uh, I think um, it Bobby was awesome, uh, and I had him for two years. Uh, but Donald Leggett also coached yeah. there. Um, I had uh, Mike Kennessy, who's an ex GB lightweight. Oh, Trigger. Um, yeah, Trigger, who coached me J 16s I had Anthony Smith, Smithy. Yeah. Um, uh, for my first two years of rowing. Um, and uh, Dickie Twyman as well. Oh, he's, yeah. He's them down there. So, like, the, the like, calibre of guys um, as, like, people as well as coaches um, that I had, I was yeah, obviously very, very fortunate. Um, and I think that obviously played a big part in me carrying on the sport, carrying on university um, and, uh, and, and being somewhat su successful. Um, but I think... Bobby's kind of style of rowing um, was influenced quite a lot by his experience as a rower. Yeah. Um, he talks quite a lot about Harry Marne. Um, yeah. 
and the coaching that um, Harry Mann gave him. And I think that was one of the reasons Donald came on board was that Donald had worked quite a lot with Harry Mann and had mm. quite a similar ethos, uh, I guess. Um, so I think, you know, if, if you watch some of the races me and Dave did as juniors, it's not nearly as polished as something like the 2018 Pools crew. Mm. But you can kind of see the same hallmarks of, of Bobby's coaching, which is just trying to be super simple, super effective around the front end, um, leaving the hands and the body nice and long, um, hanging off the handle, um, using the leg drive to really propel the boat, um, and then being really simple, clean around the finish. Um, and and I, I guess the best example I can think of to, to watch would be the, uh, the 2018 crew, uh, which yeah. is, you know, absolutely exceptional. Um, but the style they rode was, um, I mean, it was just completely um, out of, out of the league of school we're rowing, really. I mean, you've got, yeah. you've got, you've got international rowers watching that for um, as a kind of um, technique model, um, which is incredible, like 17 and 18 year olds. Yeah, um, yeah, yeah. So, yeah, I mean, yeah, a privilege to have been coached by Bobby. Um, uh, and yeah, I mean, it's great as an alum to, to, to watch what he's doing with balls kind of year on yeah. year. Yeah, yeah. I, th I think that video has got a quarter of a million views, which is sensational for a run video. Yeah, yeah. I mean, like, that that race was just awesome to watch. I mean, that crew all year was just, yeah, unstoppable. Yeah. Um, you, I, I think you look like a Cambridge oarsman. If I, if I kind of think in terms of, you know, what did Cambridge stand for, I would look and say, Freddie Davison, he's kind of like an archetypal, Cambridge yeah. Oarsman. Um, how far is that, you know, something you recognise or is that is that not the case? Yeah, no, I mean, I'll, I'll happily take that. <laughs> that sounds like a very nice description. Um, yeah, I mean, I think I'm obviously a product of, of where I rode. Cambridge was like a massive um, influence on the way I row, um, the way I train, the way I race. Um, I think, um, you know, going from school with Bobby, uh, to having Steve Trapmore coach me in my first couple of years and then on to Rob Baker. Uh, it's quite like a, um, a smooth progression, if you like, uh, in terms of technique. Um, I definitely came out of school thinking I rode better than I did and then <laughs> went up at Cambridge and swiftly realised that I didn't. Um, so that was, you know, I mean, going to Cambridge was an awesome experience and I remember like turning up and getting to row with these guys I'd watched win the boat race the year before and it was kind of like, you know, it's the classic, like, rowing with your heroes kind of day. Um, and then, you know, within a week, you obviously start thinking, oh, well, I've got to beat some of these guys if I want to make a seat. And, yeah. Um, yeah, I mean, it was a great place to be just because it pushed the standard of my rowing on so quickly in in kind of the space of a couple of years. Um, in terms of kind of the Cambridge style, um, I think a lot of the crews we watched when I was at Cambridge uh, were the 1990s Cambridge crews. Mm. We watched a lot of boat race videos, um, looked at, yeah, a lot of those 90s crews. Uh, and I've, you know, been lucky enough to meet quite a lot of those guys since, uh, kind of alumni events and stuff, um, and kind of talk, talk through what their own experiences were like. Mm. Um, and I think, you know, it's, it's fair to say the style that I've been coached to row and, and try to row is 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 very kind of archetypally around that um that kind of era of cambridge rowing uh which funnily enough was um influenced by um harry Mann as well yeah yeah um and so like it kind of comes full circle and there's 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 been like quite a um cohesive i guess technical style through my rowing career um which has kind of i guess produced produced what, what, what i do now yeah now um we don't share a lot of things because you row a lot better than I ever did. But <laughs> we have both rowed in an eight with James Cracknell. Yeah. Talk us through that experience. Yeah, I mean, it was. I mean, it was it was a really fun year. It was a great big group of guys, um, of of which James James was one of them. Um, yeah. I mean, it was uh, it was it was quite daunting actually when when he was going to turn up. I'd I'd been there for a couple of years. Heard James Cracknell was coming. Didn't really know what to expect. I think I watched a couple of his like docu series with Ben Fogel. Yeah. Um, and I didn't really know, you know, um, what what to expect from him. But you know, 
the first night he turned up um, to our kind of introductory um, get together. Um, and he quite quickly kind of made it clear he just wanted to us to kind of forget most of what we knew about him and just kind of treat him exactly like we would any any other one of the one of the guys. Um, you know, he was like pushing basically to be treated like like one of the other freshers, basically, uh, which was great. And I think like it, it started off his year at Cambridge on, on a really good foot um, and probably ingratiated him with the team um, really well. Um, and then, yeah, I mean, obviously, I think for for James, and I'm sure he'll, he'll say the same if you ask him, it was it was probably uh, quite a difficult year in terms of the training because um, mm -hmm. he'd gone from you know, being this Olympic champion, um, one of the most physiolog physiologically talented guys in the world, um, to then trying to do the same thing in his mid-40s um, and trying to balance a pretty rigorous, like, academic course as well. Um, so, I mean, for the first half of the year, all I can remember is that it took quite a toll on his body. Um, he was always in the physio room. Um, uh, and, yeah, just... I mean, I think for, for, for quite a lot of the year, he was quite focused on just trying to get himself right to be in contention for a seat. Um, but I mean, the guys who rode with him, like, learned quite a lot. Um, I think mentally more so, uh, yeah. just because like, I don't really know how to how to ex explain Kranos' mentality. But like, I think he's probably one of the like, most savage races I've come across. Oh. He's 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 very competitive uh, to the extent of thinking outside the box quite a lot. Um, there was I remember coming into the race in 2019. Um, he was threatening to pretend to like have something wrong on the start line of the boat race, and he said, "As soon as they say attention, be ready for me to start screaming." Uh, don't worry, I'm just trying to like put off the other crew. And so he was sat there on the start line, like, "Is he going to do it? Is he is he going to do it?" Um, thankfully he didn't because we told him like under no circumstances do that like um especially on tv but um yeah like he's 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 savagely competitive um but i think maybe as a product of kind of coming into the squad at an older age than the rest of us um he was also quite good at kind of um lending his wisdom rather than um being abrasive if that makes sense mm, yeah um so, I mean, my experience with him rowing wise was really only um, kind of half the year once we were in the eight. Um, but he'd always um, sit up in the bows with Dave Bell, who was the, uh, the other kind of slightly older member of the People's crew. People's champion. Yeah, the People's champion, Dave Bell. Um, so, yeah, those two old men sat in the bows. We just kind of natter away and like feed in bits of wisdom where they could. Um, but, um, yeah, I mean, he was he was like a great guy to have up in the bowels, especially um, just because he, he could kind of see everything, shout a few words of encouragement down um, and then getting on to kind of front wheel driving it with Dave Bell. But um, mm. yeah, I mean, it was definitely kind of a, a far cry from um, seeing this like physiological specimen uh, winning Olympic medals. And it was much more uh, a case of having this, really experienced really competitive guy mm. lending his experience to to a gr younger group of guys mm. um and in turn um obviously what we could get to him was um physiologically he was probably one of the weaker guys in that crew um and technically at that time um probably struggled a bit especially kind of finding length um so him and uh, him and dave both had i think um slightly different setup to help them get the length in the boat um and so what we were kind of trying to give to them from in front was um a, you know a, a, a bit more um sense of rhythm length technical aspects uh, and driving the power on um so they could kind of do their job and, and then kind of chat back to us so it's kind of a feedback loop i guess uh, and i just want to say in case dave does watch this i'm not putting in the same age bracket as cracknell <laughs> 
but he was just a bit older than the rest of us. He was only a few years uh... older. Um, but yeah, he might be able to hear me. He's literally his bedroom is like across the street from me. So, oh, yeah. ridiculous! If you're, if you're watching, Dave, I'm sorry. <laughs> um, so uh, there's a, there's a couple of things I wanted to, to ask you. I, I think one of the striking things about your result in 2022, um, or you know the the way you rose through that season, but particularly at the Worlds, was that none of you had been to a senior world championship before and you ended up winning the gold medal. Now, I guess that must have been done somewhere before, but it's quite remarkable. Did did you ever stop and think about that or did it just not occur to you? Yeah, I mean, I've, I've obviously stopped and thought about it since. I don't think going into the world championships, it really crossed my mind too much. I think... Um, in full honesty, like when I got put into the four at the beginning of last season, I was just gassed to get a seat. I was so happy mm. to have made a senior seat. Um, that was like my aim personally for the season. Um, but obviously, it's the, the kind of never ending um goalposts. Um, you know, as soon as you make one, they get further away and you go for the next thing, the next thing, the next thing. So, you know, making the four was awesome. We raced the first World Cup in Belgrade. Um, all of us at that point were just really happy to be in a seat and be racing. But we were also kind of aware that if we wanted to stay in a seat, we need to do well. We need to probably try and win. Mm. Um, and, you know, worked really hard, managed to get a win in Belgrade. And from then it was like, oh, wow, well, we've, we've got a win now. We've got to, you know, carry on this form and try and improve into the World Championship. So it was this, it was this kind of whirlwind season where we didn't really have time to really stop and think, oh my God, we're, we might, you know, win a medal at Worlds here um, in our first season as seniors. It was more, well, we've done this performance. This is what we're going to improve and we've got to replicate or make that better. Um, so, yeah, for me, it wasn't really until the end of the season that I kind of stopped and thought that was, you know, a pretty awesome experience. And I'm very lucky to have, have done that with that group of guys. Um, and I think that's the kind of the lasting thing for me was that I'm, that, that kind of first senior season, obviously, went basically as well as I could have ever hoped or yeah. dreamed. But the fact that I'm, I was able to do it with like four guys or three other guys in their first year of seniors who were all my best mates, we'd all come <laughs> kind of through that year at Brooks together, all four of us. Um, so that was, yeah, that's the kind of like lasting thing for me is that um, our kind of our hunger and mentality as a group um, was so cohesive um and we were kind of all still on the same page i don't think many of us really kind of stopped and thought about it until until after the, after the fact but yeah yeah, yeah in retrospect it's really special yeah. um you might not have necessarily an answer to this one but i was kind of mm -hmm. thinking you know obviously uh we opened the, the the show with cam keelty sort of asking the question you're you're kind of a technical model um that that he he uses um I just wondered if you have a race that you think this race was just amazing in terms of the way I was rowing, the way the crew was going. You look back on a, on a particular race in that way. I'm, I think I'd, I'd struggle to pick one out, to be honest. I mean, it's, it's really nice to hear that, you know, people look at my rowing as a, as a kind of uh, model of, of what to do. But I, I personally kind of look at my rowing as a kind of dumbed down version of the technical models I look at, if that makes sense. Yeah. So it's almost, it almost kind of feels like you're getting kind of the, the sloppy seconds or the, like the second hand, second hand <laughs> technical model. Um, but, you know, I think like for me, I, I look at kind of uh, videos of guys like Drew Ginn, James Tompkins, um, uh, those kind of, well, James Tompkins not too much, but the smaller guys who are very effective um you know the swiss four um the swiss lightweight four from a few yeah. years back um but yeah no i mean obviously like it's lovely to hear that people uh look at my rowing that way i think personally i've always been quite um pessimistic i guess is maybe not the right word but um about my own rowing i'm i'm quite quite a perfectionist i guess um I don't think I ever, I mean, I, I'll look at videos and be like, oh, I'm quite happy with how I'm rowing there. But there's always a but. There's always something I want to change about what I'm doing. Um, I think, like, probably my my favourite kind of memory of, of rowing, 
and enjoying rowing was probably the 2018 boat race. Um, yeah. Maybe that's just because it was such a kind of, I mean, a longer race um, and we were able to kind of soak up the atmosphere and enjoy it and enjoy what we've done uh, as a crew. Um, but um, yeah, I'd say that's probably watching that video of, of, of that race is probably my like one of my favorite rowing memories and how that felt. I just remember it feeling longer than it ever had. Like the physical stroke just felt longer than it ever had in training. It kind of, it was almost like we, we'd done some really good stuff in training and it was even better on race day. Um, yeah. So that's like, for me, that's, that's, that's a really cool feeling to have had. Um, but yeah. Yeah. Um, I, I, I'm conscious we're going, uh, you know, well into the, the second hour of our chat now. Um, there, are, yeah. there are a couple more questions. One of which uh, was kind of, um, I, I, I'm going to go with, um, so Cam Kilty, he kind of started and he might come to finish. So um, as much as uh, this question, can you tell us what it means to be sympathetic with the boat? Because I guess he's trying to explain to the people he coaches. Yeah, I mean, so I guess the best way to start this is um, uh, something that Steve Trapmore had up on the board in the Goldie Boathouse in Cambridge and was hammered into my head for, for two years. And whenever you ask Steve what good rowing is, he'll say the same thing. And it's um, uh, a leg-driven accelerated stroke that maximises the run of the boat on the recovery. That's <laughs> that's that's rowing. Um, and that's like good rowing. Um so I think like, obviously we've talked a bit about um, kind of the leg drive and how, how you like hanging off the handle and using the big muscles accelerates the boat. Um, so that's kind of one part of it. Um, but then you can also um, think of like the efficiency part and you want to basically get the most boat speed for what you put in. Um, and obviously the drive is only one part of that. There's a whole recovery to do. Um, and there's obviously kind of differing ways of thinking about the recovery and different rhythms and stuff. And, you know, you can watch Drew Ginn's videos on how he talks about stopping towards the back end and having a bit more of a kind of acceleration into the front. Um, if you watch some older videos, if you watch, um, there's some videos of uh, Steve Trapmore's 2008 where they got quite exaggerated flow around the back. Um, but there is definitely like a common theme um, across all those kind of really fast crews. And that's that if you watch the stern of the boat, it's not dipping in the water. So I think like visually, the you can you can you can see if someone's being sympathetic with the boat just by looking at the stern. You can see whether it's slowing down as you come to the front end, whether it's dipping down in the water. So it's that kind of visual cue. Mm. And I think like in terms of feeling, um, the feeling I'd say of being sympathetic with the boat is that you're trying to do as little as possible to disturb how the boat wants to run. So I think any any force you apply on the boat um, in the recovery is going to affect how that boat runs. Um, and the fastest you can get that boat to run is to just let it do its thing. So, I mean, what I like to think about and we kind of think about before and I have done in other crews as well is just trying to disturb the run of the boat as little as possible. And I guess the, the kind of feeling of that comes in a few ways. Um, it's kind of making sure your body weight isn't moving too fast at any any particular point. Um, there's the idea of um, having no weight on the foot stretcher. So thinking about um, the boat basically running to you rather than um, mm. you kind of moving your body weight into the front end. So that's the kind of, um, I guess, I guess the, the simplest and biggest important thing is that um, if you're moving towards the boat, you're not letting the boat come to you. So um, yeah, just thinking about having no weight on the feet and making sure that you're completely loose in all your joints and just letting the boat run under you. And it's a really nice feeling when you get it. Um, you can yeah. kind of feel the surge of the boat. Um, and at that point, obviously, it makes it easier to pick up the boat and you can put more work down. So it's this kind of, yeah, it's this like snowball effect where the better you let the boat run, the more you can do to add to it. And then the more you can let it run. Um, and then yeah that's what we're all kind of searching for i guess yeah I yeah yeah it, but um, mystical but, mystical yeah this kind of mystical ethereal rhythm that probably doesn't actually really exist um but we're all kind of looking to try and find that kind of perfect perfect feeling yeah 
Yeah. Um, so I, uh, not that one. Uh, yeah. Uh, so uh, Cam um, has given us that feedback, which is, or given you that feedback, which is great. Um, but uh, Giovanni uh, Ippolito, um, it's kind of, I was kind of going to ask you, you know, um, have you any ideas how long you carry on rowing for? What's, you know, what's life after rowing like? What do you do? It was a big, scary question, that. Um, yeah, I know. Yeah. Um, I mean, to be honest, whenever anyone asks me this, I say that I'm rowing just so I can have a bit of a buffer to think about it. <laughs> um, <laughs> I'm a, uh, I don't know, like, um, I yeah, I studied, I studied engineering at university. Um, I like, I quite enjoyed that, but I'm not sure I want to necessarily be a kind of straight up engineer. So I'm not really sure exactly what I want to do after rowing, but um, I think I've spent too long like enjoying the outdoors and doing sport to then go and sit in an office job. So, you know, maybe I will get an office job, but I think, you know, I don't think I'd necessarily enjoy it that much. Um, so yeah, I quite like to do something that has a connection to sport um, where I can be outside. Um, but yeah, I've definitely got a bit of a kind of competitive streak that I need to channel into something else. So whether that's, you know, going onto a different sport when I'm done rowing, maybe, I've always said I quite like to do an Ironman because I'm quite a slight guy um, yeah. compared to some of the other rows. So I've always thought it'd be quite fun to to see how far I could get in that and kind of relearn a new sport. Um, so maybe that'll be maybe that'll be the outlet for for the competitiveness inside. But um, yeah. yeah, and then in terms of when I'm going to stop rowing, I, I really I don't think I could tell you the answer. I, I don't I don't know. Um, I think I at the moment I'm really enjoying it. Um, I'm really enjoying the group of guys. I think for me, um, the biggest thing about kind of me carrying on rowing is that I'm enjoying spending time with the people I'm doing it with. Um, you know, I think rowing is, is great. It's a, it's a awesome sport. It's really fun when it's going well, but there's no getting away from the fact that sometimes the training can be really hard. Um, there's times where I've found rowing quite miserable. Um, and I feel like, people don't necessarily talk about that that much um, and getting to kind of the top end of the sport and doing it full time, that's only exacerbated. Mm. Um, so I think like for me to carry on doing it, I would need to really enjoy the company of the people I'm doing it with um, and the kind of culture of, of the team I'm in, uh, which I do at the moment. So, um, and then the other question is um, how long my body kind of can yeah, yeah, produce yeah. and give results. Um, and, you know, there might come a point where, I feel like I'm starting to get worse uh, or I'm, I can't kind of produce the force or, or produce the technical model that I want to. Um, and I, f I mean, personally, I think if I get to that point then I've probably carried on too long, I'd like to stop before that happens. I don't, I don't want to kind of carry on to see myself, you know, um, my, the standard of what I'm doing go down. I'd quite like to stop before that. Um, but whenever that is, I don't know. Well, my wish for you is you're on the start line in Paris in the oh, final, yeah. in a boat that's you want to be in, that's going really well, and uh, I think people listening to you talk, Freddie, about about rowing, about your love for the sport, about you know uh, the way you enjoy the camaraderie of, of the the guys that you row with in the four, just the experience that you bring, and you know, and and also uh, the wisdom about different ways that that people row talking about the history of the sport has, has been really enlightening it's been fantastic oh thank you very much and thank you very much for having me um yeah no, it's been really fun to, to kind of nerd out a bit and talk about rowing so yeah, yeah thanks. wicked okay yeah. so we'll stop the live part of this interview there thanks for tuning in everybody this has been cross's corner with the one and only freddie davison bye for now